deflationary depression of sorts. And I look at the China equity side and I say to myself, eh, you know, it looks like it's actually maybe sending a, a bottoming signal. If you were to choose between European equities and China's equities, which would you choose? I've been writing positively about Hong Kong and China for the last six, nine months. Because I lived in Hong Kong since 73. The, I moved to the north of Thailand to Chiang Mai in year 2000, but I still keep an office in Hong Kong and I go there frequently. And I've been known in Hong Kong as Dr. Doom because I was very negative about Hong Kong properties for a long time and the economic outlook. Also, because obviously China was developing and Hong Kong's importance, which was very significant relative to China in the 70s and 80s, was going to diminish. The GDP of Hong Kong, which used to be 30% of China, is now only less than 3%. But... Hong Kong will be an important city in China, in the South China zone, in the so-called Greater Bay Area. There are 80 million people that live there. So if you're the principal city there, it's an important uh, position to be in and a desirable position to be in. Now, the property in Hong Kong are going down, but the property shares sell at an 80% discount to the net asset value of the properties that they own. Now, the asset value will go down, of course, in my view, not by 80%. So I'm on your side. I own Chinese stocks. I buy Chinese stocks. And some have actually, you see, the Western media and Western analysts, they're all very negative about China. Also, the public brainwashed by the media. And the media is very evil in the Western world. They influence people thinking they don't report facts. They report the lies that the government is publishing. And the fact is simply, I've never seen in my life so much China bashing. If they want to bash something, they should bash the Chinese government, the Chinese people. What have they, uh, what have they done wrong? <laughs> Unbelievable. And all these China bashers, you go to their homes. Most of their appliances are made in China or the components that are in their appliances are made in China. They have telephones like this. Most of the components come from China. Most of the telephones are made in China. I mean, this is just a ridiculous China bashing media influenced uh, public. And the stocks, you have very good companies in China. The Western media portrays them as being state-owned and governed by the state. And so there are lots of private companies that are very well run, that are very successful. That's the point. They're very successful. That's why the Western uh, politicians and the media hates them. They hate them because they've overtaken many companies in terms of technology. It also seems a little bit hypocritical, the idea that China suppresses free speech, and we are seeing more and more of that, those kind of concerns in the US. Look, in Asia, it wouldn't be advisable for me to speak very negatively about the government in Thailand. And I, I wouldn't do it in the first place, because I think that the government in Thailand, in many ways, is actually better than in the US. <laughs> exactly. But aside from that, if you're in the Philippines, it's not advisable that you drag down Bongbong Marcos publicly, you understand, in a blog or in the media. In Asia, this is just not done. Now, in the US, the criticism is actually very strong. For in Asia, it's hard to believe that people can write so negatively about the leader of the country. <laughs> but in Asia, it's a different culture. We have freedom of speech, but people don't use this freedom frequently publicly. A, uh, a question asked on the live stream, I'll show it on the screen. This goes back to your discussion around European leaders being uh, awful. <laughs> Is this a product of long-term nepotism, do you think, when it comes to the ineptitude of those that are in power? This is a very interesting question because 
you look at these characters who are in governments nowadays, including the people in, I mean, she's no longer in New Zealand, the prime minister, but uh, you look at uh, the prime minister, the previous in Australia, and especially in America, on your northern neighbor, Mr. Trudeau, you have to scratch your head and say to you, say, what did people think about when they voted for these characters? Unbelievable. The same in Germany, the Greens and the Socialists and so forth. One of the problems I've seen, because I know some of the party leaders in Germany of the AFD, the AFD is portrayed by the Socialists and the Communists as a right extremist, party, when they are actually quite center politically seen, they're portrayed as being like a fascist organization supporting Hitler type of government, which isn't true at all. The reason that this occurred, this, I'm Swiss, I would never have thought that Switzerland would suddenly lean so far left. And I've been thinking about, you know, your question, why is it this happening? First of all, I think that America has an interest to actually destroy Europe as an independent assembly of states. I'm saying that because if you look geopolitically at Europe, the union or the friendship between Russia and Europe would lead to an incredible power. You would have the resources in Russia, the technology in Western Europe, and this and the, this combination would be unbelievably conducive to strong economic growth in the long run, and to being competitive in a in an environment of resources going up in price in the long run. So the U.S. went in. I mean, they didn't go in officially but with all kinds of NGOs, and they financed movements that led to a swing, to a shift to the left politically seen. Number two, and that I encountered, I went to a private school. The people there were essentially the sons of wealthy people in Zurich. (laughs) I occasionally meet my friends in Zurich, and I ask them, you know, because I was in the committee for the initiative for neutrality of Switzerland. I think Switzerland can make a contribution to world and world peace by staying neutral. But no, a lot of Swiss, they don't dare to speak out for neutrality. They don't like to attack the socialists. Why? Because the socialists will then go after them and harass them. And, you know, the media is very left in Switzerland. Then the media writes negative articles about these people who are on the right side politically. <laughs> and the wealthy people then get a visit from the tax people <laughs> and the tax Saudi. They can, they can make your life very difficult, I'm telling you. So a lot of wealthy people, instead of standing up and fighting for their freedom, they just lay low. They go into obscurity. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, he explained at the Harvard speech what surprised him the most in the Western world is the lack of courage. And courage is a virtue that people should uh, adopt and also implement in their own lives. If someone has no courage, forget him. The only competent government official was Nancy Pelosi, because apparently she's a phenomenal traitor. And those that are on social media are well aware of those memes. Yeah. Uh, but I want to go back to the recession question, because I think this is sort of, it is interesting. And yes, I think yes. you can even no, sorry. To go. I like it. I, like, I love it when you're fired up. I love it when you're fired up. It's okay. I, I divert it. In my view, if you look, you understand, in a money printing environment, everything gets distorted. And you can hide things. You can say you have a higher salary. And then you can understate the rate of inflation. In essence, if you take real economic growth and real wages, then the majority of people is in recession already because wages have gone up since 2018, yes. But I had discussions with people. 
In my view, prices are today about 30% higher than in 2018, 2019, pre-COVID, say between 20%, 25%, 30%. But I have friends, they say, no, they're up 50%. And I rely very heavily on a man called John Williams. He publishes Shadow Stat Statistics. The Shadow Stat Statistics, in my view, may overstate inflation a little bit, but they overstate the cost of living increases much less than the government understates the cost of living increases. And so if you take the statistics published by Williams and you adjust the economy, the nominal economy by his inflation figures, we all in recession already. But for the rich people and the people that are interviewed on the CNBC and Bloomberg and God knows what, and for Wall Street, there's no recession because their asset prices have gone up and they feel wealthier. And for Mark Faber, as an investor, I love money print because it boosts the net asset values at the cost. Who pays the cost? The lower middle class, the middle class, and the poor people. They pay the tax. They pay for the inflation, and inflation is a tax, but it touches different sectors of society differently. So if you ask me, why is the oil price weak? i tell you why. The global economy is today lower than it was in 2018 in terms of real measurement. I have many statistics that show that. And today, the automobile stocks are all down. Why are they all down? has to do with the demand people don't have the money to buy goods anymore. Dollar General said it. Other retailers say the same, that people are strapped. They have to cut down on life necessities. So what is the answer to that? I mean, it, it's <laughs> the Bitcoin maxis would say the answer to that is Bitcoin. The gold bugs would say the answer to that is gold. Is there an answer to any of that? You know, I also own gold and so forth. I'm not looking at the world as a private investor and I don't think how do I participate in the best way to exploit a very unfortunate situation that arises from money printing. I'm an economist, I'm a social observer and I'm an historian. As such, I have to condemn money printing in the strongest possible terms because it's one of the worst disasters that can come upon a society. It's an injustice that is incredible and it leads to hardship for the majority of people and it benefits a few profiteers. I have entire books on the subject. I mean, I'm not singling you out, but it gets me that people think, well, well how do we address this problem of inflation and uh, money printing? Oh, we buy bitcoins or gold. Yes, I agree with that view. But at the same time, people should think in the larger sense, what does it do to a society? And shouldn't we stop the measures, the policies that lead to inflation? Inflation, consumer price inflation, is a symptom of government overspending and of money printing. You take away the overspending, in other words, you close the deficit and you close and you stop printing money, then you have no inflation. The, the problem will be solved. But with it, the excesses, excessive profits of profiteers will go. Yeah, good, uh, you good want to that. belong to the profiteers, you're welcome. I don't want to belong to a group of people that profiteers from the harm of other people. You understand that the socialists will always attack the capitalists as the exploiters of the people. Now let's look at the history of capitalism, say from the time of uh, approximately Adam Smith at the end of the 18th century to today. What did the 19th century exploit? People went to America because they wanted to find the work and the working conditions in America were better than in Europe. That's why the Europeans all traveled to America and immigrated to America. And then, of course, the socialists write about the robber barons. The robber barons, yeah, they made a profit. What's wrong with making a profit if you assume the responsibility to build a railroad from A to B, if you build a canal from A to B? 
of course you should get a profit, but the railroad then benefits the whole population because people can travel from A to B easily and the transportation cost fell. And the result was that in 1900, the price level in America, despite the population going up from 4 million in 1800 to 80 million in 1900, the price level was the same. Because we didn't have economists in America and because we didn't have a Fed in America. <laughs> that is the reason. The worst for the economic growth is to employ a lot of economists. That I tell you, and I'm saying this as an economist, I'm, uh, I mean, <laughs> as, uh, as much an academic as a businessman. I want to get your thoughts on treasuries as we start to wrap up. Speaking about <laughs> government debt and the deficits, been a hard three years for the duration side of it. It seems like maybe some of those dynamics are changing as we go potentially from duration risk to credit risk. How do you think about long duration treasuries, at least from a trading perspective? You know, buying holds a whole different question. It, this is actually a very good question, uh, which touches many different assets. I'd like to summarize it as follows. With my negative view about the economy, you have essentially a tailwind for treasuries to go up, in other words, for interest rates to go down. That I accept. And I own treasuries. I have to say that I always have a bond portfolio. But of course, my bond portfolio varies in terms of qualities of bonds, and it varies in terms of maturities. So I have bonds that mature maybe next year. I have bonds that may mature in seven years and so forth. And I have an average maturity of such and such. I wouldn't know it by heart because I'm not spending a lot of money on the, my personal affairs specifically. But I own bonds and I've taken some duration in the U.S. with the view that the economy is actually weaker than what the Biden administration is lying to, to the public. <laughs> it's much weaker. I also think the Fed will cut rates, but you understand the Fed has a problem here. The inflationary pressures are still with us. Now, on the good side, we may argue that the weak demand will kind of reduce the demand for finished goods and that as a result of that, prices of commodities and finished goods will go down. In China, we have a sort of a deflation at the present time. Also here in Thailand, we don't have much inflation at the present time. Inflationary pressures are still with us in the asset markets. I mean, you look at house prices in America, home prices, that are record high, essentially. Not everywhere, but in general, you're surprised to see home prices this high, especially when you compare it to commercial properties, which have dropped in some cases by 70%. This is now an example where easy money hasn't helped. Property prices, commercial property prices are down very significantly. Will it spread to residential? Who knows? I suppose it will spread to, com to residential, but maybe to a lesser extent. In any event, the headwind for bonds to rally is that when in 69, 1969 and 1973, the rate of inflation was about as it was, say, in 2022-2023. At that time, interest rates on the 10 years treasuries were much higher than now, much higher. Now, the 10 years treasury is at 3.7%. You really need a period of sort of deflation to justify this low interest rate. So in my view would be the Fed is in a very difficult position because they print money. Inflation takes off again and the treasury bonds, the 30 years you can follow, the TLT ETF will tumble. That's why I hold treasuries, but I'm a reluctant holder. And also I think that once the world sees the Fed printing money again, which they will have to do, they will have to do, then they will sell the dollar. Now you will argue, well, the other currencies are even worse. Yes, I agree with you, they may be even worse, except selected ones like the Singapore dollar and the yen and so forth. But in general, the dollar is maybe still one of the soundest currencies. But I can give you some currencies that are much better than the dollar, namely gold, silver, platinum. Now you will come and say, well, what about bitcoins and cryptos? 
I don't want to give a speech about the disadvantages and advantages of currencies, but I'd just like to tell you, if governments had the power, these governments are democratically elected, they were elected by people, but then they lock in their people. If they have that kind of power, what do you think they can do to the internet? They can modi, close the internet for a whole region in India. <laughs> how, how do you want to use your credit card? How do you want to use your bitcoins without internet? I can use my gold coins in my pocket going out when there is no light and no electricity and nothing. The same in war times, cigarettes become money. You should store cigarettes in your home. This is like small coins. Well, don't smoke up your currency, I've, <laughs> if that's the case. Well, I have to, I have to keep the supply tight. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. Dr. Farr, for those who want to track more of your thoughts, more of your work, where would you point them to? And maybe give a little pitch on the Bloom, Boom, and Doom report. I'm not in the advertising business. I have two reports, which I write every month. So I do it myself, and I do it out of interest, and I do it uh, because it stimulates my thinking. And I think it's better in life to do something than to do nothing. So these are the reports. But they challenge widely accepted views and they highlight opportunities that ordinary ordinary research would maybe not highlight. So it's, it's difficult to say the report is good or not so good. Some people like it and some people don't like it. It's, that's the world. And I have contributed, I think, probably 20 pieces over the last uh, 12 years to you. So uh, I appreciate you also giving me an opportunity for that. 